else. We'll start the recording for you two. And hello, Robert. Hello, Margaret. Hi. Howdy. How are you? Not so bad. Not so bad. Not a bad day in San Diego, right? It's hard. No. Absolutely. <laughs> it's hard to have a bad day in San Diego. <laughs> That's right. I know. Especially if I know they're virtual backgrounds, but especially with the backgrounds that you have and what you two both probably get to do on a daily basis and looking at that. So that's not a bad day, a bad day. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, I'm going to fill a little bit of your time just to give Facebook a minute or two to let people know that we're here and that we're live. Um, we are, and just a little bit about Warwick. So I have a feeling that most people that are watching are pretty familiar with Warwick's, uh, but you never know. We might have somebody that's joining us that's not familiar. So okay. what's that? To my family members <laughs> from out of town, they better be on. They better be on. So we want to tell them where, um, so Scribbins Institution of uh, Oceanography is in La Jolla, but so is Warwick. So we're up in the village, they're up on the hill. So uh, Warwick's is located in La Jolla, little, little town just above San Diego, downtown San Diego, California. My little sign there says 1896. We are celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. So yeah, it's a, it's kind of a big year for us. And while we're not the oldest bookstore in the country, we're the oldest continuously family owned. So Nancy Warwick is the fourth generation owner of the store, still comes in every day. So, um, so we have some fun things. So if you're not familiar with Warwick's, get on our email list and because we've got some fun things planned for the fall for a bigger celebration, some ways to win gift cards and fun things that'll happen. So um, so join our, our email list and that'll give you also updates on these wonderful author events that we're having, uh, both virtually and starting in September, knock on some wood somewhere, we will slowly get back into offering in-store in-person events and some bigger things offsite too. So um, anyways, just a little bit about us. We're, we're open. Um, come in and see us if you want. But what I will be doing today is I'll be putting the Scripps Institution of Oceanography book into the chat section of um, the comment section of Facebook. You can easily click on that. You can choose to pick it up at the store. Like I said, we'd love to have you come in and shop or we can ship it to you. And um, we hear, we're hearing that media mail isn't as bad as everybody thinks it is. So it's getting to people quicker. <laughs> That ever then the rumors are out there. So don't be shy to, to um, because like I say, and I know that everybody, there's lots of people who watch this that are regulars and I say this all the time, um, but any way that there is to get a book, you can get it from Warwick's. We do ship and we can, we have lots of stuff that we can ship you. So um, if for tonight, today's conversation, Robert and Margaret are gonna chat for about 30, 35-ish minutes. If you have a question, please go ahead and put that into the comment section as well. I will feed those in after they're done with their conversations. Always fun to get some uh, questions in and out. If you're watching this on YouTube though, it's after the event. So I won't be able to put in any um, live questions there, but you're, if you're on Facebook with us, um, don't be shy. So with that, I'm going to introduce Robert and Margaret and then we'll let them get on with their conversation and I'll shut up and get off the screen. <laughs> so Robert Monroe. A writer and editor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego for more than 20 years is among several authors from Scripps Oceanography and beyond who have been fascinated by how the institution's development has guided the history of its home city of San Diego. Scripps has graduated from rented space in a boathouse to being the oldest oceanographic institution in the United States and a global leader in ocean and earth science at a time of great upheaval in the natural world. Joining Robert today is Margaret Lyman. Margaret was appointed the 11th director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego in July, 2013. She also served as UC San Diego's vice chancellor for marine science and dean of the School of Marine Sciences. She joined UC San Diego in October of 2013. Margaret is an award-winning oceanographer and distinguished national and international leader in ocean science, global climate and environmental issues. Her research in paleo paleo-oceanography and paleoclimatology focuses on ocean sediments and the relationship to global biochemical cycles in the history of Earth's ocean and climate. You two have a wonderful conversation. See you in about a half hour. Okay. 
great. Well, Rob, uh, it's wonderful to see you on Zoom, uh, <laughs> most of walking around the campus. Um, I think uh, people might like to know first uh, why you decided to write this history of scripts now and what resources you used uh, to, uh, to find all that history. Yeah, well, um... I got to admit, it wasn't my idea originally. The uh, um, publisher, Arcadia Publishing, came to us first. Uh, they came to the communications office looking for advice on an author. And um, originally, uh, I was thinking of, uh, or I actually did ask uh, some of our retired historians, Peter Brueggemann and Deborah Day, uh, particularly if uh, they were interested in doing that. And they're actually retired and they enjoy being retired. And I think uh, they just didn't have the bandwidth for it. So they declined. Um, and then I got to thinking, well, maybe I should just do it. Um, you know, I've been here for 20 years and I've been writing about history for a long time. And uh, just about five or six years ago, we had undertaken this project uh, in the Scripps Administration Building. It was like a photo installation. Uh, uh, sort of depicting Scripps history, and I had had to consult with a lot of people on what the you know what the greatest hits of Scripps were, and I also needed to figure out where all the photos were that you know, we could use. So in a sense, uh, that sort of set the groundwork for the book. Um, so it just seemed uh, just as well uh, for for me to do it as to you know go find a freelancer and uh, have them. Uh, you know, sort of do the same stuff that we'd be doing, only like coming to us all the time, maybe asking for help, it just seemed more efficient this way. Um, but also, um, as I started writing it, you know, it occurred to me that it's been about 40 or 50 years since there's really been a history book written about scripts. Uh, the last one I can think of is Probing the Oceans, which was written by a Scripps alum named uh, Betty Shore, and that was written, uh, take, took scripts up to about 1976 or so, and there hasn't been anything since. Um, there is a scripts, uh, uh, take it back, uh, when scripts celebrated its centennial, we have a scripts magazine, and they did, sort of did a special issue on uh, the, the first 100 years of scripts, but that's not really a book, so uh, there just haven't been a lot of chances lately for the outside world to get to know scripts, and I think people in San Diego you know, they, they kind of know that Scripps is this kind of interesting place. It's right near the beach, it's got a cool pier and things like that. And they know like interesting things happen there, but what exactly they might not know. So uh, it was exciting for me to get to write this book, which to me is like an introduction to Scripps, you know, Scripps 101. Um, and it's so exciting to me that I got to be the guy who wrote it. And so that's where we are today. Well, Julie referred to the fact that Scripps and La Jolla have sort of co-evolved and their, their history is intertwined. Um, what, uh, what did you find out about that initial time? And uh, what was La Jolla like? At the, so we should mention that, that Scripps uh, is 118 years old this year. Uh, works is 125, so they were there before Scripps. That's uh, right. But Scripps is uh, uh, it's a venerable institution. And what was uh, La Jolla like at the time that works and, and Scripps were founded? Well, for background, um, Scripps started out as an entity called the Marine Biological Association of San Diego. And it was started by a UC Berkeley, actually, there's only one UC at the time and Berkeley was it. And so you could just, you could have said University of California researcher whose name is William Ritter, the founder of Scripps. And he and, and some local city fathers and, and mothers started at the Marine Biological Association of San Diego. And its first home was in Coronado, but that wasn't a very practical location. So in, two, or in uh, 1905, um, uh, they opted to move up to La Jolla. And by that time, La Jolla, downtown La Jolla, was already well known as a 
beach destination and it was pretty built up. I, I guess there was even a rail line that connected downtown San Diego to uh, downtown uh, La Jolla. But where Scripps is now, the, the area that's called La Jolla Shores, there was nothing there, absolutely nothing. Um, there were some cows from a nearby ranch that would come down on occasion and a bunch of scrub and a, sort of a little swampy area and that is it. Um, so the, the history of uh, La Jolla Shores, that part of town really does track pretty closely with the development of Scripps. First, uh, Scripps uh, built its first building, which is which was originally called the George H. Scripps Laboratory in 1910. Uh, in fact, it's the building I'm sitting in now where my office is. Um, and that was the first building there for a while. And then um, the namesakes of Scripps of Oceanography, uh, Ellen Browning Scripps and E.W. Scripps, um, they were the ones who really kept uh, the place afloat for the first uh, 15 years or so. And they, after the building, this building, they built a whole colony of little cottages and so forth and some outbuildings and they got started on the pier. Um, and because the area was kind of remote at that time, it was really hard to get into downtown La Jolla. It's like all mud roads and so forth. And, you know, if you walked, it would take like two hours or something like that. And, you know, it's just difficult. So it became a very self-contained little community over here, with all the academics and their families and so forth. And there are all these funny stories of, uh, you know, there's one guy who had one car and he would go into town and buy groceries for everybody. And then he'd drop them off in this building here and people would come on and collect them. Uh, but they had to be quick because there's this desert tortoise that just hung out around and he would dart into this building and like steal people's fruit and go running off into the bushes. And so you had to be quick if you want to get your groceries because the, the tortoise would come and get it. And likewise, uh, there was a nearby dairy farm and, and I guess it was a problem in the early days that cows would just kind of come walking into this building just to you know, get out of the heat or something like that. And, you know, and then we try to plant uh, landscaping and, and they'd just come and trample on it or eat it or <laughs> things like that. So it was, it was rough living, rough living uh, back in those days. Oh, like uh, yeah, and then like in, sort of in the 20s uh, is when uh, the La Jolla, what's now La Jolla Shores Drive came in and when um, the La Jolla Shores subdivision came in. And uh, so we've, we've kind of grown up together, we and our neighbors, as men are speaking. That's great. So um, you and I <clears throat> talked before about what uh, an incredible influence World War II was on the development of oceanography and of scripts. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that's really when scripts came into its own. That's what I was finding as I was going along. I mean, scripts has had a relationship with the, the military since the end of World War I. Uh, I think it took World War I for the United States government to realize that, uh, you know, they really needed to get a handle on what was going on in the oceans. And there was a one place in the United States that could go to it for info. Um, and that was Scripps. And so that's when the relationship started. And so it was kind of already mature by the time World War II came around. And uh, also around that time, um, the University of California, this is actually before World War II ever started, had developed a division of war research, it was called. Um, and its headquarters were down in Point Loma. And a lot of the people who staffed that place were people from Scripps. Um, and so we worked very closely with the, the military. Then there were about 11, I think, or 13 researchers at Scripps at the time. And seven of them were uh, called to service in the military. So it was a very it was a lonely place around campus because everyone was doing various things. Um, but uh, you know, Scripps really devoted everything it had to the war effort. And it gave up its entire fleet uh, to the Navy. And most of its research became uh, sort of national defense oriented. Um, the most famous of that is probably the work that Walter Monk did and Harold Sverdrup 
Harold Sverdrup was the director at the time and Walter Munk went on to become like the most famous oceanographer ever. And their claim to fame, at least as far as World War II was that uh, they developed all the um, uh, wave forecasts and swell forecasts that the US military used uh, when planning uh, uh, in, you know, uh, amphibious uh, um, invasions and so forth. And um, then they taught a whole slew of uh, meteorologists in the military how to do that too. And so some of them were the ones who actually planned the D-Day invasion, picked the day, picked the location, picked when conditions were right for people to go wading in the water and, and get on the shore. And I, I know a famous story I've, I've heard a million times is that uh, uh, right before D-Day, uh, General Eisenhower wrote uh, a resignation letter just because he was so worried that it wouldn't work out. Uh, he was so worried that the, the, the prediction wouldn't be right, that uh, he thought it was gonna be on him if it, it you know, turned into a disaster. And so he was ready to, to hand in his resignation all over that one sci scientific uh, um, forecast. And luckily it worked out for him and for the allies. Um, but. We, we did so many other things in World War II and we found out so many things, it turns out. Um, we found out that uh, there's so much substance in the ocean that uh, if you try to do sonar readings of the bottom of the ocean, and you probably know this better than I do, uh, you can't always do it because there's so much backscatter, which is just stuff in the water. And we helped the allies learn how to use that to our advantage. You, could, you learned how to like hide submarines under the backscatter and they learned that sounds in the ocean from, you know, that were picked up by sonar sometimes were being caused by aggregations of uh, little critters, especially like little snapping shrimp, which are just getting big colonies. And, just... and if you could park your submarine right in front of that, then the, the enemy would, would think that that was just a, like a, you know, this is a shrimp and you could hide there and not be detected by sonar, stuff like that. And I, it seems like, and this is my take on it, uh, that it's really where oceanography in general came into its own uh, because like I mentioned, there's the Division of War Research, which is located in Point Loma, California. And uh, there were sort of competing teams of scientists trying to figure out various things. One of them was uh, try, how, trying to figure out how to detect enemy submarines, right? And the physicists, who were there did not like the oceanographers apparently they looked down on them they thought they were a bunch of hacks you know <laughs> um and the physicist idea for detecting enemy submarines was like basically take a big flashlight and you know turn on the flashlight and you'll you'll find the sub which oceanographers now know it was kind of a ridiculous idea even like the most powerful flashlight doesn't go much more beyond you know, 100 feet or so and then you know it just hits a wall of backscatter um so the physicists gave up on it and turned the problem over to the oceanographers and that's how sonar kind of became the way to find uh enemy submarines but it worked out for the, the physicists it sounds like because they all got moved over to los alamos and started the manhattan project and so they had a <laughs> they had a role to play too absolutely so um after World War II uh, was a great phase of oceanography as we set out in ships and really started exploring the ocean. And Scripps had a big role there too. Oh yeah. Um, and our, our relationship with the, with the Navy really helped. Um, they had a ton of surplus vessels. And so we got three or four ships and all of a sudden, boom, Scripps had a fleet and uh, the National Science Foundation was a brand new entity, and they were willing to fund sort of just basic science, you know, just go out and find out things, um, uh, which I think you would agree is probably a little bit harder to sell these days in right. the current environment. Um, and I don't know, my sense of the 50s was that it was just very like fancy free in the sense that uh, 
they would uh, plan out these big uh, expeditions across the Pacific and spend sort of three or four months out there. And it seemed like anybody at Scripps who wasn't doing anything that month would just like get on the ship and like go, go do uh, research, you know, and some of those old um, expeditions were, you know, had a, had a gaggle of biologists and, a, and geophysicists and so forth. And just everybody who was interested in anything just seemed to just go along for the ride. Um, so I can imagine like the, the, the campus was probably a pretty quiet place for a while when, when everyone was out in sea, but I mean, that's when all like the pure discovery happened. So, was, well, that's when the pure discovery started to happen in, in a new kind of way. Um, and that's where we found out things like where the deepest part of the ocean was and, uh, where people, um, started to kind of get the basics of plate tectonics going. Um, I know that Scripps can, can't take full credit for that, but some of the groundwork, I think, for plate tectonics definitely started at Scripps. Um, so, yeah, it was just an exciting time. Uh, like, any idea was a good one, it seemed like. Um, and they were definitely motivated to keep going. Um, one piece of evidence for that is uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the space program was happening in the 60s. And Scripps scientists were worried that um, ocean exploration was getting sort of short shrift. It wasn't as cool as going to the moon, but it was still important. So that's how, uh, according to my research, uh, how the Mohole project happened. And that's something that happened in 1961. Um, and the idea was to drill to the mantle of the earth. Um, so uh, it, it didn't get that far off the ground, but uh, it, it did yield some uh, really interesting science, especially, and this is like right up uh, your alley, I believe. Um, it, it demonstrated or showed scientists how they can do things like drill into the crust of the earth and, and get uh, sediment cores uh, in a much more effective manner and really go back into history. But, uh, you know, it was just such an interesting time uh, on that cruise, the cruise where they went out to sort of demonstrate that it's possible. And, uh, John Steinbeck went out with them and, and covered it for Life magazine because he was just as fascinated as everybody else by it. So those are just fun times and they seem a little more freewheeling than maybe things are now. Right. Well, that was uh, actually uh, fairly successful in that nobody had ever done that kind of drilling before and they had to invent a lot of the technology uh, they had to invent technology that would allow them to uh, once they started a hole uh, drilling a hole they had to be able to go back into it and so they had to invent a whole technology using sonar to position the ship and then to direct the the drill to go back into the hole and that was all done uh, just for that that program. Now it's now it's uh, technology that's used everywhere. Is that uh, dynamic positioning? Is dynamic that that? positioning. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the the uh, Scripps faculty uh, invented the or developed the algorithms to do it, and the the uh, uh, the technology itself, and and uh, they they brought this uh, sort of a uh, it looked like a like a ship's uh, wheel, but mounted horizontally, uh, and put it on the ship, and then tried it out, and it worked. So they went out to went out to sea, and they actually did do multiple uh, reentries of the hole, and they got all the way through the sediments and collected the salt from the the uh, the seafloor underneath the sediments. Yeah, it's amazing. Right. So right. there have been some other big personalities uh, associated with Scripps as well. Oh, um, yeah. Um, I think I should show some movies now. Sure. OK. This is not in the book, unfortunately, because they're movies. Um, but I just, some of these are, like, are really funny, I think. And all of this, people, is uh, available on YouTube if you go look for it. But this is, I was, this is like an example of some of the people who and critters who came to visit Scripps and who were pretty prominent at the time. Here's one, this is uh, Errol Flynn. 
Hoyer gave me a seagull's eye view of the California coastline. Uh, it's not sure. Two friends of mine were expecting me. Uh oh, Rob. these friends were. Whoa. Not sharing? Okay, hang on. No, oh, I didn't hit share screen, no wonder. All right, take two. Yes, now we can see. Ah. Marine scientists connected with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I can see them on the lawn below, waiting for us to land. I knew they'd kid me about needing a haircut, but I had to let it grow for my next picture. Well, there was Carl, looking as if he'd just come out of his laboratory. To be exact, Dr. Carl L. Hubbs, professor of biology, other members of the staff, and of course, Laura, that's Mrs. Hubbs, just as keen a scientist as her famous husband. The Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which has been operating at La Jolla since 1910, is a branch of the University of California. And its general purpose is to study all and every phase of the scientific life of the ocean. For one like myself, the work being carried on at the institution bore a continuing fascination. And I was no stranger to the institution's dog either, because I'd pulled ashore here many times from my schooner, the Zaga. Well, Carl said that he had an idea and he wanted to talk it over with me. Well, we could go on forever, but let me just... Uh... <laughs> One thing I like to point out is that um, even back then, wait, how do I see? I just want to make sure I can get my screen back. Well, I don't know. It's up at the top, Rob. It says stop sharing. Aha. There you go. All right. Well, anyways. Um, oh, some other uh, famous people more recently, uh, a couple of astronauts. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, right now, um, our alumna Megan MacArthur is uh, up in the International International Space Station. Um, this is her second trip to space. She has the distinction of being the last person to touch uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. She, um, well, by touch, that means that she operated the robotic arm that uh, was the last thing to touch the telescope before it went off. And Jessica Meir is uh, uh, another uh, alumna who, um, I guess about three or four years ago, I think that uh, uh, she was in space. Um, so yeah, I and mean, we do, we do uh, produce our share of uh, celebs, most out, most uh, That's great. Certainly. That's great. Um, so um, it, as you thought about this, uh, what was the thing that you uh, found about scripts that maybe you didn't know before that you thought was most interesting? Like, wow, I never knew that happened. Well, um, that's a good one. Um, I mean, I'd heard a lot of it before, but I think uh, just sort of the totality of its accomplishments is what really hit me. Uh, I mean, we already mentioned about World War II uh, and the fact that it kind of defined the term oceanography um, you know, the term had existed since the 1870s or so, uh, but it meant different things to different people. It was meant uh, by some people to mean sort of that part of geology that kind of extended into the oceans. Uh, to others, it meant more mar marine biology. And um, it wasn't until the 40s with uh, Harold Sverdrup, who was actually in that picture with um, Errol Flynn just a second ago, uh, and uh, co-researchers that they kind of made it the holistic thing that it is now where it encompasses everything, earth science and ocean science, atmospheric science and life science. Uh, they were looked at as somewhat uh, distinct things. Um, so when people talk about oceanography today, they're talking about a concept that really originated here. And uh, I feel like I could go on forever. Um, if you see a surf forecast, uh, that started when World War II with uh, Walter Monk um, uh, for the military. Uh, I say that the modern era of climate change really started at Scripps uh, using the, I uh, use the Keeling curve as, as sort of the starting point because that has been become kind of the icon of uh, uh, measuring climate change. For those of you who don't know, that's a measurement of 
how much CO2 is in the air, which is the uh, key byproduct of uh, uh, you know fossil fuel combustion. Um, I mean everything. I mean if you if uh, fishing vessels use uh, fish finders, the, that technology originated at Scripps. Um, the most exciting thing, probably to me as a layman, anyways, uh, in oceanography in the last several years has been uh, the Argo network because uh, science has never had this ability to like look at all of the oceans at once um, um, and down to depths of 6,500 feet or so. And I mean, that's just an amazing ability. And that tech really started at Scripps. Um, there's just so, so many firsts, um, um, you know, all research diving that didn't like the manuals for that didn't exist when our people started doing that in the, the 50s and 60s. And so we wrote the manuals. It's, it's just a, an amazing amount of stuff that came from here. And that, that was surprising when I just sort of started adding up all the firsts and all the superlatives. Great. Well, you're, you're you're, both you and I have in the background uh, photos of Scripps Pier, and uh, there's a long uh, historic record of measurements uh, off the end of the pier uh, that, that is over 100 years long now. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us about that? Well, uh, it, it's a hallmark of Scripps to uh, do long-term observations. Uh, you know, the Keeling curve is more than 60 years old. Uh, there's a program called Cal Coffee, uh, which means they take a ship out and make the same measurements in the same places uh, every quarter of every year. And they've been doing that since 1949. And uh, off our pier, almost as soon as it was built, there was someone going out to the end of the pier, uh, taking measurements of uh, temperature and then later on salinity. And so that started in 1916. And that uh, has become the oldest record in the Pacific Rim of ocean temperature. And that means something. I mean, last year we set a record. It was almost 80 degrees out there in the water uh, just off the end of the pier. And if we'd only been taking that measurement for you know, 20 years or so, that'd be like, oh, that's, that's kind of cool. I mean, I don't know if that's a big deal or not, but once the hottest has been in a hundred plus years, that's saying something. And so that's sort of the, a testament to long-term observation. And it's only because, you know, people throughout the years, every single day, volunteer to go out there, walk out there and, and drop a line. It's all done by hand and, and make those measurements. And yeah, that's all science gets done. It's not always sexy, but it's totally necessary, you know? Right. And it's those long records that let us explore change in the ocean, different kind of exploration instead of needing a ship or a submersible or something, you need people who had the vision to start measuring a long time ago. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, that's amazing that they do that by hand out there. I saw a documentary or something they did. They did, you guys did something, uh, either a news report or something was on it not that long ago. Fascinating. Right. And they do it by hand so that it's ex done exactly the same way. Uh, and you couldn't even do it with uh, well with an instrument because you want to get just that very surface of the water and the instrument would be sitting there and the waves would be going up and down so you wouldn't get just the surface. Isn't that, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. And I have to correct myself because while Warwick's is 125 years old, you guys have us on how long you've been in La Jolla because Warwick's didn't come out to La Jolla till the 30s. Oh. So uh, ah. they, yeah, you got us. <laughs> <laughs> you got us on that one. So, um, but still well, coming out to La Jolla in the thirties for a guy that was coming from Minnesota, he had some kind of vision out there. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, the, the, the scripts, uh, it, you know, Ellen Browning scripts and her brothers came here from the Midwest uh, as well and, uh, and set up shop when, you know, even San Diego was a pretty, pretty small place. Right, exactly. I want to get to the book a little bit, Rob, and then we do have some questions that I'm going to get to. Okay. Um, when you were doing the book, and so tell us a little bit, maybe the people aren't familiar with the, um, Ameri with the way Arcadia does their books. It's a lot of photos that are involved with this as well, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a very, very template driven series of books. And I'm not sure if people haven't seen this one, they've seen other ones in the series. They have one. I live in Poway and they have one for Poway and right. Ranch Bernardo and, you know, um, and so it's a very precise format that they have you follow. Um, so it's very visual. I mean, people, when they, when they yeah. get this, it's a, so it's not just like reading a textbook about the not at all no and, and no way do i represent it at, to be like a scholarly historical deep dive you know by a, a trained historian it's it's a top level kind of yeah. intro to scripts like i was mentioning earlier but i think it's what i think is if you're really accessible to the lay person that just wants to know a little bit more about what the institute is about and if they want to go and do a deep dive right then exactly there's, then there's and, other and, places to go yeah i mean uh in just because we have the reputation doesn't necessarily mean people can just walk on campus and get the the lowdown on what we do. Um, we still get to this day questions that, you know, are you related to Scripps Research Institute, which is you know just up the street from us? Or honest to God, I got a, a, a query from a reporter about two months ago asking for a comment about uh, a data breach at Scripps Hospital, and I'd say <laughs> no relation nice. whatsoever. Yeah. But you know, it's just. You know, well, just, and I think that I think that speaks to the Scripps name. Oh well, yeah, I mean how prolific they are, and that name is in the San Diego community. Oh, totally, yeah, absolutely. You know, Good even on them, though yeah. it's like they're they're all separate entities, but um, <laughs> yeah. that name is is very well known and respected around San Diego. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, so PD Howler's on here and said that um, their dad was a, with Scripps in 1956 to 57. So they were back there back in the day and was always wondering if uh, they had um, ever met, if they had ever met Walter Monk. So kind of a fun comment there. Kind of goes back to the history of what San Diego is, right? So Maxine is asking, um, and this I don't know, so this might be for you, Margaret, um, but she's wondering oh, why did it take so long for the um, institution to offer an undergraduate major program in marine science? Ah, that's a great question. Totally you, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, while uh, th there have been undergraduate oceanography courses and so forth, at the graduate level, uh, it's really the, the use of biology, chemistry, physics, geology to study the ocean. And so for a long time, people said uh, what they wanted was a person who had gotten an undergraduate degree in one of those basic uh, fields and then would apply that to oceanography. And we took, started taking a look at that uh, about 10 years ago and said, you know, the, the field has developed so much that there are characteristics of it that are, are, are inherent to the field. And that if you come into it without some knowledge of that, it could be, uh, you can move faster if you understand. So we started offering uh, undergraduate programs. We had always offered uh, the earth science major for UCSD, uh, but then we started offering marine biology first and then um, environmental systems, uh, which uh, is both science and social science policy. And about four years ago, we started an oceans and atmosphere uh, major. Interesting. Okay, this topic, Frederica, I see you're asking this question. I'm not sure if you're still on with us or not. And this may or may not be in relation to the institution, but she's asking about the La Jolla Cove and the seals. And, the, and what it's creating a new ecosystem out there and is wondering if, is there anything that the Institute is, can do to protect that? Or um, is that even part of your domain? Uh, well, it, it, we're not responsible for uh, conserving uh, environments, although we do a lot of research that helps the people that are responsible. Uh, I would say those seals are thriving out there. <laughs> Uh, I th think the, the biggest thing we are Well, I think her question was more of towards the cove. It's like, so that the cove is changing because of the seals. Yes, the cove is changing because of the seals. And uh, I think that the, uh, you know, that's a, a, a perennial issue for uh, the city 
think, right. you know, uh, because people remember back when, uh, when they weren't there and it was a really easy place, especially for children uh, to, to go and to play in the sand and to have a protected area where they could just uh, interact with the ocean. And, you know, you can understand why people crave that. Uh, but then since the seals have moved in, uh, everybody's concerned about their welfare as well. So uh, that's a great example of uh, balancing uh, nature versus, uh, versus our social desires. And uh, th those are hard questions. So hard we, questions. we leave those to the policy folks. Right. And there's policy. And I mean, there's, there's and I'm, I'm a director of events. I don't know what I'm talking about here, but I mean, just as a citizen in San Diego and, and uh, of the planet, you know, the nature part of it is like the seals are there. There's, is there a natural predator that should be there taking care of that? Who knows? And if that's not happening, you know, what, what else is happening in the ocean? So like you said, that's a whole other, a whole yeah. other topic. <laughs> um, so uh, Janine is just asking if you need volunteers for any ocean projects and can wait for me to fly west, please let her know. <laughs> we'll do. We, we have is, a lot of volunteers. I was just going to ask you about that. Is there a way for if somebody's watching this that they can come and help with their what 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 could an average citizen do with the institute? Is there anything? Well, the the place where we have the most volunteers is at Birch Aquarium. So Scripps operates a public aquarium, Birch Aquarium. Uh, that has a half a million visitors a, a year. It's very big. And uh, they have hundreds of volunteers and volunteers in lots of areas. Uh, you know, some are like helping out with the uh, programs for children. Some are helping with the, uh, the exhibits. Some are helping, a lot are docents. So they get to learn a lot about the, the aquarium and then engage the public. Uh, and then uh, several of our oceanographic programs have our research programs have volunteers as well. And in general, they're looking either they're uh, programs that work along the coast and and have need for volunteers who can go out and get samples at at uh, you know on, on regular uh, times, or uh, that are willing to help out with some of the more mundane tasks in the in the lab, uh, but we have lots of volunteers. Excellent. And is there a website that you can direct people to that they can find out more information about that? Uh, I will. Well, while, while you're asking Rob the next question, I'll yep. see if I can pull it up and put a link in. The Excellent. Yeah, okay. I think it's just aquarium.ucsd.edu. I would gather. There is a question for you, Rob from Raquel, and okay. uh, you might have answered this earlier, and she might not, but I don't know. So. Um, She'd love to know more about your connection to the institution and how and when you decided to write this book. Uh, well, I mean, I think the query from uh, the publisher, Arcadia, came about two years ago. And um, like I said, I've been affiliated with Scripps now for about 20 and a half years. Um, uh, I'm the editor of Scripps' science magazine, which is called Explorations now. Um, and uh, a lot, most of the news that comes out of Scripps, uh, uh, I write a, quite a few of the, the releases. Uh, so I've just been sort of immersed for kind of a long time. Yeah, and it, interesting. And like I said, the Arcadia, um, the Arcadia books are just fantastic about the different things in San Diego. And so um, I'm really glad that they highlighted um, the institution. I think it's a really... Um, uh, so Janine's asking, do you have a next project? Are you working on anything? Or are you just working on stuff for the institution? I think it's a one-off. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I'm helping one of our researchers write his book, uh, but uh, that's uh, kind of a more behind the scenes thing. So it's a little bit more low key. Uh, but yeah, I think now I just go back to my little desk and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Too much stuff. you've had the you've had your fame and glory that's, now that's, right? this is it this is all of it is right here this is your 15 minutes of fame or or an hour's worth of fame 45 Take minutes it. of fame just now yeah <laughs> you had your so, 45 minutes more than my share so there you go uh, thank you margaret for those links that was fantastic yes, yes. Yeah. well i you know rob uh writes uh a lot of the articles that are on our website that are you know, really insight, deep insight into 
some really complex science and he makes it so easy to understand and the, the articles are just fantastic. So, um, uh, uh, you know, if people uh, look around on the website and see something that uh, really interests them, there's a really good chance that Rob wrote that article. Good job, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> but that's the thing too, is it, and it is a talent because it's just like to take some of the technical stuff that you all do and bring it into a layman's language that is impactful to us, that makes sense to us, that, you know, that's how we're all going to learn about what we need to do to help. To help play. Well, I was going to say one cool thing that we do do now is we try to make our scientists a little more communication savvy so that they can be their own spokespeople because, uh, you know, their voices just have to be out in the public. Um, uh, traditionally scientists don't want to be in that place because they feel it's not their place or, you know, they're right. steering from, scholarship and advocacy or you know it's you know time spent talking is time spent not researching that kind of thing right uh, but i think you know the paradigm is changing in just the last 20 years i've seen a real uh, increase in people who want to improve their writing skills and so anytime students uh, want to test out their writing um we're more than happy to have them write for our magazine <laughs> and, yeah and that's and that's actually that's, good for them because if they get published i mean that's you know that's good for them and their and their quest for what they need to do. I mean, because there's not a lot of, unfortunately, there's not a lot of publications anymore that count for being published at, and there's still that criteria out there for people. So yeah, that's a good thing. All right, this was really fun and really informative, and I'm so happy to be able to uh, bring out to our audience what's happening at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Thank you both very much. Well, thanks for having us, Thank Julie. you. Yeah. So um, again, everybody, the book is in the link. You can get that there. Um, Margaret put information. Is there any social, do you have anything, or do you like staying in the background, Robert? Do you have anything that people wanted to like, do, do, can they get to you at the institution if they have any questions? They can certainly uh, find my uh, Twitter feed, which is uh, just uh, scripts underscore R or... Um, Scripps news at UCSD edu uh, gets to us. Uh, Perfect. But yeah, any follow up questions on anything, I'm happy to to field them and Excellent. answer them as best I can. Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure meeting both of you, and thank you both for your time. And um, we've been selling this. We've been we've been selling a lot of this book already at the store. So hopefully, we'll be continue to sell, continue to sell. Hey, it's most of the proceeds go to research at Scripps and UCSD. I should have said that. Oh, that's a really good thing to know. Yeah, the yes. from, from Arcadia. So that's fantastic. And um, it will be a perennial um, favorite, I'm sure, on the Warwick shelves for many years to come. So great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care.